I'll, I'll talk today about some of the some of the work that we've been doing uh, lately at the uh, at the Advanced Light Source, uh, using machine learning to stabilize our our uh, electron beam source. Um, and um, I want to mention right off the bat, this is basically a, a work that I did uh, in in uh, in, a, in a DOE uh, sponsored low project, uh, mainly with uh, a grad student and a, and a postdoc uh, at the time. Um, and uh, so this this is a been kind of a collaborative effort across uh, various parts of the ALS here. Um, I'm I'm not sure with this audience how how familiar everybody is with the with the uh, with the ALS. So I figured I'll just give you guys a very short uh, overview of of where we are and what we do, uh, so they have an idea what where all of this is happening. Uh, the ALS is in is in Berkeley, California. Uh, you can see here uh, over here is uh, San Francisco and and downtown Berkeley here, and there's the Berkeley campus, and right on the hill. Uh, above the Berkeley campus is uh, where this old 1930s dome stands, and we've uh, basically that, that houses nowadays the uh, the ALS concept complex. Um, in there, under that dome, uh, is uh, basically the leftover of uh, Lawrence's 184-inch uh, cyclotron that he built in 1940. Uh, and actually, the yoke is the is the part that they've left in there uh, because actually it holds our crane, as you can see here. Uh, but pretty much everything else was torn out of there in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was replaced with uh, a 50 MeV Linac uh, and uh, a booster ring uh, up to uh, 1.9 Jeff. Uh, originally, when it was built in 92, it was just 1.5. Um, and this serves then as the injector complex to the uh, storage ring. It's a 1.9 GV storage ring, um, uh, just about 200 meters in circumference. And this is how we've been uh, operating the ELS ever since, uh, or how the ALS has been operated since since ninety three. Um, in the tunnel, um, you'll uh, you'll see the uh, basically. I'm, sh I'm showing you here just a typical sector here. It's a, it's a triple bend acromat lattice. Uh, so uh, each sector here consists of these three bends here that you see. Um, in three sectors, we've taken out the center bend and replaced it with a superconducting uh, bend here for hard X ray production. Um, all our bent magnets serve as as source points. Um, along with insertion devices that we have in about uh, 10 straights for a total of, of 14 insertion devices right now, which uh, of which 12 are, are operational. Uh, and these are uh, then the source points that go out to uh, uh, in total um, 40 beam lines um, distributed throughout the complex, um, doing uh, covering basically um, pretty much everything that you would want to do with soft X-rays. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, a couple of hard X-ray beam lines that we run off of these uh, super bends. Uh, we've operated that way for about 5,000 hours a year uh, for just about 2,000 users a year, um, and uh, we're uh, we're we're obviously we're we're uh, we're, we, we're operated uh, for uh, for the DOE uh, Office of Science. So um, that's just basically the ALS and 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 what we do there uh, on a very high level. Um, and, and since, uh, since I'm going to focus on, on trying to stabilize uh, uh, electron beams, I, I thought it would be prudent to, to start out by, by pointing out that all of this is happening um, kind of as, as we stand uh, uh, proverbially on the, on the shoulders of giants here. There's been a tremendous effort that has gone into stabilizing electron beams and, and synchrotrons uh, for about three decades now. Um, and, and all I'm going to talk about today happens basically on top of that effort. So if you if you ultimately if you want to stabilize your your your, your light source uh, you and you want to stabilize your electron beam that, that generates the radiation, uh, the first thing you you're concerned with is is intensity stability, and that is something that is taken care of um, commonly nowadays with with pop off injection where we basically uh, we 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 re inject um, at the ALS as 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 frequently as as every 13 seconds to just to keep our current uh, stable to within a very narrow band. Um, and, um, and th that is something that, again, is done commonly uh, across many uh, third generation facilities. Uh, so that, that basically takes care of intensity stability to a very high degree. Uh, the next thing you probably worry about is, is position and angle stability. Um, and this is, this is particularly an issue for, uh, for low energy rings like the ALS, uh, because you have this very low beam rigidity uh, and you're faced with these strong insertion devices uh, with, with strong fields that act on this very wobbly beam and especially when these insertion devices change their configuration, I'm thinking here primarily about EPUs, right? Where we, we don't just change the vertical gap, but we can also change the longitudinal phase shift of the device. Uh, that can, can act back on the beam. And it's, it's very difficult making that entirely transparent uh, to everybody else who's sitting on the ring. And so this is, this is really, a, this has been a major uh, topic of research for the last two to three decades 
Um, and one thing that is commonly done here is to use orbit feedback. Right? This, this you'll find this in pretty much every third generation storage ring, uh, where you stabilize the beam position angle uh, over a very wide frequency range, all the way to hundreds of hertz, um, against uh, the the uh, the effects of these uh, insert devices, but of course also against you know uh, vibrations, uh, unsettlement, these kinds of things. Uh, that has been very successfully done. Um, but of course, that's not all of it yet, right? You're, you still have um, you you have the, the 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 focusing effect of these devices. Uh, so what is also commonly done is you you operate feet forwards that act locally on quadrupoles in the vicinity of these of these insertion devices, and they they uh, they compensate for the uh, the focusing errors induced by configuration changes in these in these devices. Um, and on top of that, we also run a tune feedback. Again, this is something that's commonly found uh, where you stabilize the working point of the machine. Uh, on top of all of this to a very high degree. This is primarily important for the uh, for, for multi-bunch uh, feedback systems and ensuring the collective stability of the beam. Um, and then the final the final ingredient here is um, is related to the fact that of course these insertion devices they don't just uh, they don't just uh, impart uh, upright quadrupole fields onto the beam, but of course also uh, skew errors, right? Uh, so in addition, you also run a feed forward acting on local skew quadrupoles uh, to try to compensate for these errors coming off the devices. Um, and this, this turns out to be, to be a, real, a real big problem. Um, it's, for one, it's, 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 very, it's very costly to record these uh, lookup tables that you use to, to do this compensation. Uh, for a typical EPU at ALS, this takes you know, eight hours easily. Um, and so uh, you know, even, even if we spent uh, you know, a considerable amount of the physics time that we have yet every year on just recording these tables and re-recording them, uh, you know, the, the, these tables have to, have to last for a long time. For us, on average, it would be about half a year. Um, and the problem is, of course, that the machine drifts right? over, over those time scales. You know, the machine is no longer identical to the machine that the feed for table is recorded on. Uh, so, you know, as, as time progresses and the machine drifts away, you're, the, 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 the correction based on this table uh, um, uh, deteriorates, um, and and this this is starting to show. This has become a real problem. So let me let me try to show you what the what the what for us the source of the problem was. Um, here, here on the right hand side, you see uh, uh, the image of of one of our diagnostic beam lines. Uh, this is actually a, a, a beam line um, sitting on the on the first bend of sector three arc. Um, it takes X rays uh, off of that bend. Um, in this location, we have an almost round beam, even though we have a very low emittance coupling ratio. In this location, we have very large beta Y. So this gives us good vertical resolution. Um, and, and we use this beam line to, to measure uh, these beam sizes uh, throughout user ops. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what I show you up here on the, on the top left. Uh, over a 24 hour period of user ops, you see here this recorded horizontal and vertical beam size. And indeed, you see the horizontal and blue is, is nice and stable, uh, what you'd want. Uh, the red, the vertical, not so much, right? You see that there's, you know, there's these quite distinctive jumps here every once in a while. Um, and if you if you look real close, you'll see, of course, that they line up exactly with changes in insertion device configurations. That's what I have down here. I'm showing you just vertical gaps of of some of our insertion devices. Um, the, the 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 longitudinal drift haven't even been included here. Um, and um, and you'll see that each one of these jumps here lines up very nicely. With such a configuration change, and this is despite all of these measures that I just talked about, right? This is this is this happens uh, in spite of of all of the feed forwards and the feedbacks that we that we operate. This is the residual that we that we're that we're concerned with. Now, if you, if you just look at the size of this, you know, this is this these jumps that you look at here. This is on a four percent level, um, and you know, traditionally this was considered acceptable, right? If it's below ten percent source size variation, third generation sources, people have considered that you know uh, to be to be okay. Um, and it has been for a long time, uh, but now uh, this is this is this is starting to become a real problem. Um, and what I what I want to do here is is just show you what what this looks like for for the actual experiment, uh, what the effect of this is. So I, I've chosen here a, a scanning transition X-ray microscope that we have at, at ALS Beamline five three two two to show you a typical scan uh, that they would perform, you know, during user ops. Uh, the way this works is there. Uh, they, in this case here, they've removed the sample. So we're just directly imaging the, the photon beam as it arrives at the end station. And they start here at the top left, they scan you know, one line at a time, 500 pixels, takes them about, um, about one second to do a line here. Uh, and then they go from top to bottom. Uh, so the whole scan takes about five minutes. 
And, uh, and indeed, you can see that you know, on, these, on these time scales, there are these rather strong variations in intensity here. Um, and you can compare that to, uh, to this image down here, where I asked the beamline scientists there to repeat such a scan, uh, but now during physics, when we made sure that we didn't have any ID motion going on. And you can see what a dramatic difference this is between what they are usually faced with in use routes and, and what they would like to see. It's essentially the noise floor of their beamline. Okay. Um, it's important to, to understand here that the way these experiment works is usually these are differential measurements, right? They'll do one of these scans at a certain energy, then they'll repeat the exact same scan at a slightly different energy on the same sample, same location in the sample, and they'll end up basically uh, subtracting the two from each other. So this 3% intensity variation here, this basically determines their noise floor, their, their resolution. Um, and of course, where they want to go is is what you see down here at the bottom. So to them, this is this is a real big problem. Um, now you could be tempted to argue, well, you know, can't you just somehow measure the incoming intensity and normalize with that? Uh, and it turns out, unfortunately, that's really hard to do. Uh, the um, for those of you who are not familiar with these types of experiments, you know, there, there is an incredibly cramped geometry. This is a there's a there's a there's a zone plate in there that creates you know a focal length on the order of about a millimeter. Um, and and you're 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 trying to uh, image you know on a, on a 20 nanometer spot size. Uh, there is very little room to get something in there, and and the attempts that have been made show that it's very hard to get a good proxy for the actual intensity on on, on sample. Um, so after many attempts at this and failing, uh, the conclusion was kind of well, this ultimately will have to be solved by 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 stabilizing directly the electron beam at the source. Uh, you can't you can't take care of this after the fact. And for us, uh, the uh, sense of urgency here is, is given basically by the fact that you know, this, is a, this is a type of experiment that is going to become uh, much more common in, in future storage rings, right? Diffracting limited storage rings, fourth generation rings, um, you know, new machines like Sirius that have just come online or ESRF upgrade, uh, but also upgrade projects that are still ongoing like APSU, ALSU. Uh, these types of machines will, will have many more such experiments. And if they want to really exploit uh, the potential of these, of these new lattices, um, they they will need to find a way to, to deal with this. Um, so so this was kind of this this to us was uh, was what got us started on on this project here. Um, we uh, we we became very intrigued with with machine learning because we because we learned that you know that that one of its strengths is that it's really good at modeling these very nonlinear processes, which which this is here. Uh, turns out um, they're, it's very flexible, which which is good for us because these. These insertion device configurations, they change constantly. Even the insertion devices themselves, they, they change every couple of years. Um, what we thought was very attractive is the fact that we don't require an a priori physics understanding. Um, and, and the reason I say this is because all of what you've, what you've basically seen, the, the entire problem is the result of, 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 of or is the, the, the residual left behind after we do our physics model-based corrections, all our systematic corrections. Um, so they, they kind of, this kind of gives you an idea of the limitation of our physics understanding of the system, right? These, these residuals, uh, they basically describe the, the part of the system that we that our physics understanding doesn't properly cover. Uh, so to us, it felt very attractive to try to use a tool on top of all of that uh, that doesn't rely on any on any physics model to try to take out these, these perturbations. Um, we we uh, we were able to confirm in, in experiments, of course, that, that this is very reproducible, right? If you if you set up the machine in a certain configuration, you do something to it, the response will always be uh, the same. Um, and um, we we also learned that you know we we will need really large data sets in order to to for, for training purposes. Um, but one advantage is that you know with the digital control systems that we have, this data is already there and it's already being archived, right? So it's basically it's it's just waiting uh, to be exploited. And all of that kind of uh, indicates to us that, that machine learning would be quite effective to try out on this problem. So we did a very simple first experiment. Right? Uh, the, uh, the, the grad students and the postdoc that, that were working on this at the time, they, they, they basically set up a very simple uh, neural network architecture um, where they, 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 they use recorded data uh, from, from user operations in ALS um, that, that described the, the configuration of the insert devices through 26 independent parameters, um, along with the recorded vertical beam size of this diagnostic beam line that I just showed you guys. Um, and they simply trained the network to give a prediction for how the vertical beam size would change um, as, um, as insertion device configurations change. Um, 
And this was on a fairly limited data set, it was just, I think, about roughly a, a week of, of user ops data. And it didn't take a whole lot of time to train. Um, and of course, they, they spent some, some time on, on a hyperparameter tuning. But the, the bottom line was that with rather limited effort, uh, we already achieved really good predictions for how, how uh, the, the beam size in, in ALS would change whenever a device changes its configuration. And the example I show you here, uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers, you'll see that you know, these predictions are now within 0.3% RMS. And if you recall, these typical errors that we're looking at are several percent. Right? So this, this gave us kind of an indication that this, this could be a very good tool uh, to get predictions for these changes that we could exploit. Um, or some people, you know, we're quick to point out, well, you know, uh, how is this any different from just taking a very high order polynomial and doing some, you know, some regression? Um, and, and, uh, and one person particularly who was very skeptical about this, you know, decided to just do it. Uh, so we, we kind of, we, we started, you know, with a you know, simple linear regression quadratic, and then we just stepped up the order uh, for the exact same problem, the exact same data I just showed you. And then you see uh, the, the actual data here, you know, and you see how the, the neural network prediction follows it to a much higher degree than the than the uh, the polynomials. Um, more interesting to me personally was the fact that as we stepped the, up the polynomial order, um, the, the 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 prediction error started to saturate. So around sixth or seventh order polynomial, there was no improvement in the prediction at all, right? And we were still about an order of magnitude away uh, in terms of error from from what we were getting from this very simple neural network, uh, which which to me was a really a strong indication that this this was indeed a, a very powerful tool for for uh, for this problem. Um, so with with so, so that kind of gave confidence that we 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 we're now armed with a good prediction for about for what's about to happen in the machine um, when when somebody changes you know the configuration of their of their insertion device. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, now that you have prediction, how do you you know how do you how do you use that to stabilize? How do you correct for it? Um, and um, what we're able to exploit here um, is uh, is is the fact that. Uh, and it's quite common in, in third generation storage drains like the ALS uh, to actually uh, to, to symmetrize the lattice and to get rid of, of, of or to minimize beta strong coupling to try to take out as much of the spurious dispersion as you can before you go into user ops. Um, in reality, usually that's not where you stop, right? Because if you, if you ran the machine that way, you'd usually end up getting really bad lifetime. Um, so what we do and what is commonly done in several facilities is we excite our, the skew quarter pulse in our machine um, to to create this vertical dispersion wave. So we, as you see here, we use 32 skew quads here. We excite uh, this wave of vertical dispersion throughout the machine. Uh, this vertical dispersion drives uh, basically eigenmo two emittance or vertical emittance. Um, and that is ultimately what then, this, this blows up the vertical beam size. That's how you regain the lifetime. Um, but, but ultimately what it means now is that you, you are equipped with a direct knob to act on a global property. And just to show you how sizable this is in, in a machine like the ALS. Um, so uh, here, is, here is a typical, for a typical EPU in, in ALS, we recorded you know, the, the, the beam size, again, at this diagnostic beam line versus the, uh, the, uh, the phase shift of, of the device across its full operational range. Um, and if you just put this device in the machine and you, and you, you run it around, um, what you'd end up with is, is basically what we see here, this, this red trace, right? This very large variation of, of beam size. That's of course not how you run. What you what you run with are these are these local feed forwards that I that I mentioned that correct for the skew quadruple errors, and that brings you down to this to the level here of of, of the green and the blue trace. Um, but actually, that's not how what you would see in the actual ALS in operations. Uh, what you see is is basically this magenta trace up here, and the the entire excitation in in or the, the increase in vertical beam size. This uh, this is given by this vertical dispersion wave. Um, that we that we excite and and this is this is really a dominating contribution to our vertical beam size. Um, but what this means essentially is that we do indeed have we have a knob to globally change uh, the uh, the source size throughout the ALS. And the idea was then, well, if we if we had a prediction for how the source size is about to change in the machine uh, before it does, then we can act back on this dispersion wave and adjust it uh, by a small amount to try to compensate for that. And if this all works according to plan, then that should stabilize the vertical beam size in, in the ALS. So th this was this was pretty much the idea uh, at the at the beginning. Um, so um, let me show you how 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 we tried to implement that. Um, 
first part is is obviously the the training of of this of this neural network uh, that will serve as our as our as our predictive model. Um, so what we what we do in practice is we we acquire um, the, the various um, uh, various PVs in the machine that describe, for example, the configuration of all the search devices, uh, the configuration of these two quadruples, as well as the recorded vertical beam size. Um, and we use that for training. Um, and the the output then of that of that whole process gives us this this neural network, uh, which then uh, gives us these predictions, right? And once we have that network, the way we can then apply it is just by reversing uh, the whole process. We basically, we, we, during user operations, we constantly query the machine for the configuration of the insertion devices at that point in time and feed that to the neural network. And the neural network then just basically says, well, for this, you know, for the configuration of these IDs, you know, on the order of 36 parameters, uh, these are the beam sizes that you know I would expect for certain excitations of skew quadrupoles, um, and the, the the feed forward that we now want to run to to implement this correction uh, has to do nothing else than just go and look up which skew quadrupole configuration belongs to the beam size that you're trying to stabilize at, um, and when it picks up that prediction, uh, it will um, it will just um, it will update the, uh, the, the the power supplies for those two quadrupoles with these new values. Um, it sets those to the machine, and 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 you're done. Basically, that's one step, and then you just keep uh, iterating that as you as you go. That's that's basically the entire idea. It's it's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple idea. Now, I I probably don't have to spend a whole lot of time on on this slide. I'm pretty sure you guys know a whole lot more than I do about how neural networks work. Uh, I will just point out how the network that we use or what we've ended up using, uh, what roughly that looks like. Um, the, the, the input layer, as I mentioned, encapsulates all the insert device configurations. So for us, that is roughly 35 uh, PVs, um, along with one parameter that we use to describe how strongly we excite uh, this vertical dispersion wave. Um, and the, the output layer basically consists of a single prediction. It's, uh, it's this prediction for uh, the, 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 the measured beam size at uh, this diagnostic beam line with a very good resolution in the, in the vertical plane. Um, so this, and, and this, this obviously would then be the, 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 the data that we use for training. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail here on, on otherwise on the, on the, on the network topology. Um, it's, it's, it's a very simple network. It has just three layers, you know, it's fully connected. Um, but it's 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 a very it's a it's a very simple network and and training doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, the the, um, the predictive quality I, I hope I can convince you of that with some data later on is is really uh, very high and definitely uh, good enough for for us to to start using it. So then, if you for now just assume that we have that network and it's giving us these 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 good predictions, uh, then again the the way we implement this in the real machine is that. Uh, we run this as a, as a feed forward uh, closed loop at three hertz. Uh, so basically, three times a second, we we will give the network all the insert device settings in the entire machine, along with a whole array of possible changes in excitation of skew quadrupoles. Um, and what the network then returns is just uh, an array of beam size predictions. Right, and the feed forward goes in there and it picks the excitation that best. Um, results in in the beam size that you're that you're trying to stabilize at it applies that um that all of that is very quick right the, the actual the, the network query takes you know on the order of uh, i don't know two milliseconds then setting these values on the skew quadrupole power supplies again that's just a couple milliseconds the actually these changes actually arriving at the at the beam that takes a bit longer but that's basically related to the the fact that these are solid iron they're, they're laminated but uh, excuse me they're they're, they're not solid they're, they're laminated magnets um, so they, they have good frequency response, but still, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bulky magnet. Uh, you have to go through a, a, a vacuum chamber. Um, so it, it will take on the order of maybe, you know, tens of milliseconds for this to arrive at the beam. But the whole process easily is done within less than 100 milliseconds. So you could easily think of running this at a much higher frequency. Uh, in practice, we just haven't done that because we haven't seen the need so far. Um, but but this is this is essentially... Uh, the process and and uh, and you just keep repeating that at this frequency, um, and and you're done. So let me let me show you now in reality what, what 
what it looks like and how it works. Uh, and, and you be the judge uh, of, of um, the, the quality of this. Um, so we start out with, with training data, right? The first thing we need is we need to get a lot of training data. Um, I mentioned before that we, we record all our insert devices in these metric beam sizes, and we've done that for many years already. Um, what, we, what we don't do, and the reason why we actually need to specifically collect new data is we don't usually vary this dispersion wave by uh, significant amounts. Uh, and we never did it in the past during user ops. We usually do it right before we go into user ops, we set it at a value that gives us a certain uh, desired vertical emittance and then we just leave it there. And this is the one part that's still missing here. So we actually, for train, for, to collect good training data, we, we went into a physics shift and we decided to ramp this vertical dispersion wave around to basically scan it uh, so, that we, uh, so that we can sample uh, as much of, of parameter space as possible. And, and so I'm, I'm just showing you here a picture of, of, of that going on. So this is, this is an 11 hour period um, that we had. Uh, what I'm showing you here, I think is just about a, a little more than an hour. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a busy plot. I'll, I'll, I'll try, to, try to explain the most important part. So the, the red trace here is basically this vertical beam size that we measure at diagnostic beam line. Uh, for comparison, you see in blue, the, the horizontal. Um, and then the, the black trace is us scanning this vertical dispersion wave at a fixed frequency. We just scan it through a, through a, a I, I would call this a fairly narrow range um, in terms of the effect on beam size, but it's a very large range in terms of what traditionally we, we operated the machine on. Um, and while we scan it, you can see this, this beam size follow here to a certain degree but not entirely because of course there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. What we're also doing is we're trying to scan our insert device configurations you know, as, as, as thoroughly as we can. Uh, so we have a quasi-randomized quasi fashion of, of coming up with, uh, with all kinds of different vertical gaps that we apply to the devices and when, then we, we change their phase shift. Um, and we're recording all of that. And um, uh, we, we did this basically throughout the entire uh, 11 hour shift here. Um, and this then serves as the as the as the data uh, that we use to train the first uh, the first network here. Um, that took about fifty minutes on a single core, you know, regular desktop CPU, nothing fancy, something you could uh, you you could buy on Amazon right now. Um, and once we once we had this this network trained up, uh, then we we just we kept everything as it is and made just one change. And that is we stopped scanning this dispersion wave. And instead now we took the prediction that, that we got from the model for what this dispersion wave should be and applied that to the machine directly in the speed forward configuration that I just used before. Um, so what you see here is still, you see all these insertion devices that are still being, they're still being scanned uh, over their, 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 their full range. Um, but you'll see here that when we turn this feed forward on at this point over here, you know, this, this, this red trace here, this vertical beam size that has been fluctuating quite a bit, it collapses, right? And it becomes uh, rather stable until we turn this feed forward off again. And then you see, you know, the beam size start to do uh, something else again. And just to give you an idea it, to make this, to, to, to quantify this, you know, before you're looking at something like, uh, uh, like uh, about one and a half microns RMS, and this collapse is almost tenfold down to about 0.2 over this short period here. Um, so, so this gave us some indication, you know, that this this could actually work. This is this is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but the, the the real question, of course, is not you know does it does it does it stabilize the electron beam at that one location where we're we're looking at at this at this very sensitive source point uh, at the diagnostic beam line. Uh, what we're really curious in finding out is you know does it does it also does is it really as we claim a global stabilization is it something that uh, that another beam line, uh, one of our uh, sensitive user beam lines, uh, would actually see where, where it really counts. Um, and so we went back to this to this stick at five three two two, and we uh, we had the beam line scientists there perform another one of these scans. So the ones at the top are the ones you've already seen. And now this scan down here, this was taken right about the middle of this period here where this feed forward was on. You know, and you can see indeed that. Um, it, it's cleaned up a lot, uh, but you can also see that it's you know there's still some variation in there. It's still not as nice and calm as 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 you would want it to be. But there's some indication there that there's still there's still um, there's still work for us to do. Um, yeah, this is just uh, basically 
uh, this is this is just a a, a line uh, basically plotted these images here plotted uh, versus uh, line number uh, just kind of to give you an idea here um, the, the the very calm uh, period during physics you know was this blue trace up here and you see there's actually some kind of long term intensity change that was going on here related to the detector uh, what they what they usually face before would be this this red uh, one down here. This is from from this image up here, and then what we're comparing to now is is this uh, is this feed forward on trace here, which has already become a lot a lot calmer. Um, uh, one other thing we did was also look at the frequency content. Right, you you want to make sure when you run this feed forward that indeed what we're doing is we're stabilizing on the relevant time scales that we're targeting, uh, but we're not exciting any kind of uh, of noise in other parts of the spectrum. And we did that indeed. We see that you know down here. Uh, basically, at, at very low frequency, uh, we we are able to stabilize, you know, on the order of 12 dB, uh, without adversely affecting, you know, higher frequencies, which they would be very concerned with. Um, so that 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 turned out to work as well. Um, but of course, all of this was still fairly artificial, right? We're still doing this on a physics shift. You know, we're controlling what the other insertion devices are doing. Um, we we at this point, you know, we, we felt fairly confident this was going to work, but we but we still had to show that it actually works during actual user operations when when uh, when the users themselves control these devices. Um, so we, we took this network that we had trained and we decided to just test it um, in, in a real user ops shift. Um, and we did that. Uh, what I'm showing you here is now I think this is about 12 hours of user ops period. Um, Current is almost stable. We're fighting with our injector a little bit here. That's why you see sometimes our current drops a little bit, but primarily we're we're stable at 500 milliamps. Um, again, here you know in, in blue is this horizontal beam size. It's very nice and flat, exactly what you want it to be. And then in red here you see the uh, the vertical beam size. Um, and now we're running this feed forward at the same time. Um, and you actually see the action of this feed forward. How we how how the feed forward is is using these neural network predictions to to update the uh, the vertical dispersion wave, uh, you see that basically in this this black trace, right? You see it you see it reacting heavily to changes in, in insertion device configurations. Um, there's way too many to put on the same plot here, but there's a couple down here, and you can see, for example, down here, there's there's one device. Uh, this is one of our EPUs that does a lot of this switching, so they switch polarization back and forth the whole time. Um, that's what they're doing here. Um, and now, if you look at this this red trace, you know you can clearly see that the, vertically we're still not we're still not as good as the horizontal. Basically, what, where we'd want to be, um, but we've we've already mentioned cleaning it up quite a bit. We're now about 0.4 micron RMS, so within about a factor two uh, of where we want to go. Um, so those of you who look real close here, uh, you'll notice that there's a period uh, where we're not doing so well at all. Right? There's there's this period here where there's there's a lot a lot of this switching here seems to bleed over and still show up in our in our vertical beam size. And the interesting thing about this is it it, it, uh, it turned out that the reason for that uh, was that uh, what the, is the configuration of another insertion device that unfortunately I don't have on this plot here uh, that was sitting at a certain gap range um, that in conjunction with this device doing the switching here actually manages to to find its way onto the onto the beam uncorrected for it. Um, and the whole reason this is so interesting is because the, the other device turns out was not included in our training data. It was, it was a device that was not operational while we were recording training data. So it was just sitting there apart. Um, but then when we go into user ops and, and, and people start using it again, um, we realize that you know, it, it, it has an actual effect and because the network hasn't been trained on it, it doesn't know how to, how to deal with this. Uh, so it's a, kind of an interesting example um, uh, for, for something that we, were in, that, we, that we wanted to try out. Uh, we figured we we would like to see if we could somehow retrain the model online. Right? If we could use actual user ops data uh, to retrain the model and try to make the predictions better by incorporating more recent uh, user ops data. Um, so we 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 and I think this this serves as a good as a good case for that, right? You if you you happen to we've reached a part of parameter space here that the model isn't familiar with. Um, but of course, with this recorded data, we could we could make it familiar with that part of parameter space and hopefully get better predictions in the future. Um, so here, uh, just uh, let me see if I can get rid of this here. Oh yeah, there works. Okay, um, here's here's just a, a very simple cartoon image of of what we're trying to do here with the, the retraining for it. Um, so far, everything I've showed you is is basically something that I would consider fairly conventional. 
uh, machine learning application, right? Where we're, we're doing a physics shift, you know, we, we, we scan our input space to, to generate training data. Uh, we train the model uh, and this model is then used, you know, for predictions, uh, allows us to do this heat for during user operations. Um, what we exploit is the fact that we can, you know, we continue to collect data during user operations, even with the feed forward running. Uh, this is this is data that we can collect, and we can combine it with the original data, um, and retrain the model. Um, and um, one of the very nice things about this application is that the the feed forward relies on 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 this network for its for its predictions, but the network itself can be swapped out at any time on the fly, right? So if we if we manage in, in in retraining the network using more recent data, especially data where you know for example uh, the the performance of the feed forward wasn't really good because we were sitting in a part of parameter space that was poorly sampled initially, um, we can take that data, include it um, into the or uh, combine it with the with the with the original training data, retrain the model. If we can convince ourselves that the that the, the this new neural network has a better predictive capability than the old one, then we just swap it in on the fly. Um, and better yet, you can think of doing this continuously, right? So we can just continuously um, retrain the neural network. Um, and, and in that sense, try to keep the network up to date with a machine that is still drifting, right? Where we know that you know, after a while, the, the predictions would become poorer just because the machine has drifted away from the configuration it originally was in when we, when we took the original training data. But by doing this continuous online retraining, we basically incorporate a feedback element into our feed forward, and we try to have uh, try to keep the network up to date with the with the drifting machine. So, uh, just one example of of using such an online retrain network. Um, here, uh, a very similar image to what I just showed you before. Again, this is about twelve hours of user ops data. Um, again, in blue, you see the the horizontal beep size really nice and stable, exactly where we want to be. Uh, you see the vertical now in red here uh, has become, again, a whole lot better than it initially was. Um, you can see also quite a difference when we, just to, to drive this point home, when we turn the feed forward on at this point here, you know, all of this stuff over here collapses and we are now really, uh, we're, we're stabilized to a very high degree. Um, um, very close actually to the, to the to the to the resolution of the of the beam size measurement, which is right about here at this roughly 0.3%. So we're not quite there yet, but almost getting getting really close uh, using this this retrained uh, network here. Um, again, the the ultimate benchmark for all of this here is not what we see on the machine side with our diagnostic beamline. The ultimate benchmark is really does it benefit you know the users that are most sensitive beamlines. Um, so here now, just a, a, a stick some scan again. Um, that was taken, I think if I recall correctly, it was right about here, if you can see my, my mouse pointer. Um, right around here, um, we, we asked the beamline scientists to take another scan and uh, it's a uh, it, scan looks a bit different, color code is different, but the, the, the intensity variation across the scan now is about 0.6%. Um, and this is now another improvement on top of what we, what we saw before. And this indeed now is bringing us very close to the noise floor of, of that of that end station, which is probably the, the most sensitive one we have in the AOS today. So, um, so yeah, my, my time is almost up. I'll, I'll just, I'll summarize here uh, for you guys roughly what we've seen um, in, in conclusion here. Um, so viewed from the machine side, what we're essentially doing with this, with this neural network based uh, stabilization feed forward here is we're bringing down our residual vertical um, uh, size changes um, from roughly one micron RMS, we're bringing them down uh, by about a factor of five. Um, we're now well below a percent RMS. Uh, we're getting it uh, fairly close to the, the resolution of our, of our diagnostic beamline. Uh, and this is now bringing regular user ops top off at 500 million. Um, as viewed from uh, the most sensitive source point that, that we have in the ALS, what they basically see is that you know, this is this again. This is the calm machine, right? This is what they would like to see all the time. Um, and what in the past they were faced with is something ugly like this. Um, and we've managed now with this this feed four, we've managed to to get to, to compensate for these variations uh, down to uh, a level that um, it's it's not quite. We're not quite there yet, um, but we're we're getting rather close 
uh, to the noise floor of this of this end station, and that is something that they can uh, they can really uh, that for them leads to uh, to a dramatic increase in the in the in the in the in the, in the, uh, the resolution that they have at their experiment. So this is kind of uh, where where we stand now with with online retraining. What we've been able to do so far, or at least before the the pandemic started interfering with with our work here. Let me just uh, let me just conclude by. Uh, by acknowledging all the people that, that collaborate in this, this was uh, this was an, an effort across uh, several groups at, at ALS, and I definitely want to acknowledge uh, the help I had from all those people. I especially want to point out uh, Shui Lu, who's a grad student at the time, working with us. Uh, he defended his PhD successfully two years ago. He's now working at Facebook and making a tremendous amount of money. Um, then Nathan Melton over here is a, a postdoc. He was working with us at the time too. Uh, he's moved on to Livermore now, on a, on a scientist position there. Um, they had a, they, they did a whole lot of work here on this, and I, I definitely want to want to acknowledge that. Yeah, that, that that's pretty much it. I, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.